he came back down, he had to show maneuvers in space to demonstrate that he'd actually made it up there. But to send him and his capsule into space, they used a rocket. The rocket was the launch vehicle. The capsule in the Gemini missions tried to spacewalk first, tried to be in orbit first, tried to stay longer in space. Well, lots of the water. Until eventually, we set a goal that was so far in advance that no, nobody would believe it was possible. And it would require a much bigger rocket. Well, look off to the left hand side. You see that uh, dock there, that uh, lock and dam system? That opens up down on the other side to the Pearl River. And on this side, we have our seven and a half mile long canal that goes all the way back behind. Well, that's what we do here at John C. Stanley Space Center. Those pieces arrive to us fully constructed. Just like what you saw behind the Infinity Science Center. And sometimes we can take them straight out to our buildings to test them, our test dates. But sometimes we need to store them. And in order to store them, we need some large buildings with some giant doors on them. Y'all don't see anything like that around here, do you? The buildings to our right were originally purposed for those Saturn V first and second stages. After that, they were used for the external fuel tank of the space shuttle, along with the RS-25 rocket engines of the space shuttle. But today, National Data Buoy Center has leased these buildings from NASA. They work on buoys, warehousing their equipment in the building we've already passed. The buoys that they work on, you can see off to the right, those are refurbished, which means we bring in a buoy that's been on the water for a long period of time. We clean it up, we repaint it, put new sensory equipment, new weather stations, new solar panels on it. And that work gets done in the building we're passing now with the open doors and all the vehicles parked out front. This is where the crew performs the maintenance on those buoys. Well, they get all fixed up and they get replaced out in waterways around the world because those buoys are important. They gather information for us about our weather. They are part of National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administrations, That's cool. which we call NOAA. That is one branch of NOAA that we have here is National Data Buoy. The other branch is also in that building, a little less marked, but is National Fisheries. Look at this end of the building. You see the giant doors? Mm -hmm. The giant doors open and close. And inside that portion of the building is a 200 aquarium fish in. That's not what they're doing. They use that building for pressure testing dive equipment, being in a deep ocean dive. And that's to check that. They also test that's you know, the NEX. They RUFUS. Next. RUFUS stands for Research Underwater Fisheries Assessment System. But they're not even our largest agency. They're just one of the 50 agencies we brought over to become part of John C. Stanley Space Center. The largest agency that we have is the United States Navy. We have the Navy Meteorology and Oceanography Command here. There's over 3,000 individuals attached to that, conducting research all around the world. Prisons in the Naval Research Laboratories. In this facility, they innovate and engineer technologies used for maritime application. They develop the technologies used on the bridge of the boat. Take a look off to the left-hand side of the bus here. I don't want to look at the right here to too. the left, we have Mississippi Technology Transfer Center. They bring in high-skill, high-wage jobs to South Mississippi. They do that by offering technology to private enterprises which use that technology on the open civilian market. An example would be the NASA technology of memory foam. <laughs> if we gave memory foam to a company called Tempur-Pedic, they might develop a product like a mattress and sell that on the open market. Take a look off to the right here. You'll see Naval Oceanographic Office. In this building, 
the Navy houses one of the most powerful supercomputers in the world, keeping real-time data of what's taking place in our Earth's oceans as we speak for the United States military. Take a look off to the left, please. As you look off to the left, you'll see two rocket engines in front of this building. Those are what we test here at John C. Stennis Space Center. The rocket engine off to the left-hand side is an RS-25, the type of rocket engine you find on the bottom of a space shuttle. There would be three of them there. Space Shuttle SME. That's the Space Shuttle Main Engine SME. On the right, you saw a smaller rocket engine. That's a J-2 segments called stages. That's a little bit the first piece of it falls away after a height of about 38 miles. The second piece falls away at 115 miles. Why would we drop away pieces of the rocket? We get rid of the weight. Exactly. He had built rockets for the Germans during World War II. He the one I put the comment on the gravestone to let us know that there was no getting out. If you look up to the right, you'll see we've got a couple of universities here. Oh, sorry, guys. Yeah, Mississippi State guys. University and the University of Southern Mississippi. Filming and didn't realize it. Now, they offer a one-year master's degree in hydrographic science. If you wanted to participate I see that in word. oceanography, and you want to test sites, the area that we're going yeah, into yeah. is restricted. The people who are out there working on oceanography, or working on uh, counting fish species and fish populations, or making buoys, they're not allowed in this section except to tour like you're doing. So access to this area is restricted. The roadway that leads off to the right here leads out to the heat complex. You're not going to see anything down that roadway because you're not supposed to. But down there, they're performing component testing. They're working on their next generation of hydrogen gas or cryogenic liquid. Oh, there's the left behind them trees. And some yellow buildings. Components that are going to go onto rocket engines. They can also micro-scale the rocket engine and test fire in there in the stage. We have some of it. You see, but NASA hires agencies. And the agencies like Aerojet Rocket 9 produce the rocket engines that are in NASA's rocket engines. But we give them the design to produce. The company on to our right hand side has a high pressure gas facility. In this facility, it's not NASA, but they take oxygen right out of the air and they pressurize it. Then they cool it to cryogenic temperatures. And they force it and then use that liquid oxygen to mix in our combustion chambers or in the actual nozzles of our rocket engine. Fire it into the combustion chamber to be ignited. And you've already mixed it. Now, you're going to get a much better view of the beach complex in just a moment. They hear that? But you would not want to stand any no, closer that. than that parking lot back there while we were taking history of being kind. Those engines put out 1,522,000 inside the bus. This is the type of the building. This is the type of building required to hold down one of those giant pieces of rocket. Wow. On the stage, while you fire that off all huge. five of the rocket engines at one time. The you see the giant crane at the top? That giant crane is used to lift the stage from a barge and put it into the test stand. Where does it put it? Well, where you have those two fuel tanks right now, those are in the way. Those fuel tanks are in that stand because we're only testing one rocket engine at a time in that stand today. But during a cluster fire stage there. test, you would have an entire stage in that section of scaffolding with the rocket nozzles pointed down. And you see this platform that extends out the right hand side of the building? This platform that's extended toward us now is about where the rocket nozzles would stop. 
they wouldn't be lowered any lower than that. There would be peace in there, they would then hold it in place and fuel it all the way up. Because the stage has its own fuel tanks inside the fuel tanks in order to test it. Take a look off to the right now. Do you see the yellowish, rust colored bucket on the bottom of the stand? That is a flame deflector bucket. It takes the exhaust from a rocket engine test and diverts it from vertical to horizontal across the ground. Now, the first rocket engine test ever to take place here at John C. Stennis Space Center took place in the stand that we are closest to now. That is the A2 test stand. What they did was they used the crane and they took a second stage of the Saturn V rocket, the Saturn S1B, and they lifted it in the air. By lifting that in the air, they then placed it where you see the fuel tanks in position right now. The nozzles would settle just over the flame deflector bucket. They would fill it with fuel when it was ready for the test fire and it had been properly mounted in, in place. Huh. They would fire off all five of the engines that they had on the bottom of it, which was a J2 on the Saturn S1B. So those five J2s each put out about 225,000 pounds of thrust. So collectively they put out 1,125,000 pounds of thrust amongst the five of them. The exhaust would be the product of hydrogen and oxygen gas combustion. And it would reach temperatures close to 6,000 degrees Fahrenheit. The problem with that bucket is it's made out of steel. So what's going to happen to a steel bucket as you continue to fire temperature at it at close to 6,000 degrees Fahrenheit? No. First, it's going to start to glow a little bit. An RS-68 is a aerojet rocket ion engine. It's one of the most powerful engines used today. It is a liquid fuel single chamber combustion engine. Puts out approximately 705,000 pounds of thrust for a single rocket engine. It's what you would find on the bottom of the Delta IV Heavy. The Delta IV Heavy recently launched a satellite to the corona of the sun. This satellite is the Parker Space Probe. It collects data on solar weather. It uses uh, that data to help protect our satellite networks here on Earth. What's that? Yeah, on Earth. Yeah. The other side of the stand, okay. if you look at the NASA meatball, you see the scaffolding on the other side. Looks like a big tower has been built there of, of metal, like a steel structure of metal. Well, all of that is framework so we can place a new rocket core stage in that stand. This new rocket core stage, refuel it, fire it off again, allow it to do refuel it, so on and so forth, for 10 times over 10 days. This engine that I'm talking about is the AR-22. It's a modified version of the RS-25. The AR-22 went on the back of the DARPA Phantom space plane. Fire station. This space plane is designed to take up satellites for 10 days in a row, sequence per sequence. So if our satellite network is attacked, we can continually launch satellites to replace that and get our critical component systems back in place. Quite a lot here. has been taking place this, here. This is all We've been NASA conducting here. rocket engine like tests for little city us, within NASA. The city. As it applies to RS-25s themselves. This is crazy. For our SLS. Now, the RS-25 rocket engine is... Got our space shuttle right here. A lot of welding work. It's 
That's the bottom part that shoots up, shoots up the rocket. We won't call it a spaceship, we'll call it a rocket. I think it's the fuel tank. The fuel tank? Maybe. I don't see anything that says like anything. Yeah, but you would think, where's a rocket fuel, right? If it would ever even fly, which I don't think it did have to go. Or if it did, it, it, it did fly. Always shooting up and down, so I just switched. So I know the camera's probably crooked. So let's pause. It's a cool picture. All that work just to lie to us. <laughs> Colin said, All that work just to lie to us. All that money. All that money. Alright. Yeah, I didn't get to show y'all what it looks like inside of it. It looks like it's made out of copper. I'm guessing that because of the green in there. I guess we're really stand next to it and get a picture to show how big it is compared to you. Suck it, kids. Alright, and this is what they say. This is like a replica of what they say they landed on the moon with. I wonder if they can hear me talking with all their little radars. <laughs> Who knows? Got a little 5G box behind us. Pretty cool. But no. Uh-huh. You don't want to say it on here. You don't want to say it on here? No. Big old anchor. What is that? Anchor. anchor. You want to sit on it and take a picture? Huh? Boys are getting too old. They don't want to take pictures anymore. Say no. No pictures. Tsunami. Tsunami boy. The little boy. F1 rocket engine. See the engines were those things that were right behind where it shoots out the fire. Oh, alligators. Yeah. Oh, and I'm back out long ways again. I'm sorry, y'all. It's just easier to hold this phone up and down than sideways. So this one's lower, so they stopped it where kids can't jump up. National Astronaut, uh, what is it say? Aeronautics and Space Administration. Alright, pause it.